Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that you draw us into your family by your spirit. Call, gather, enlighten, and sanctify the whole Christian church on earth. Keep it in the one true faith in Jesus Christ. As we hear your word this evening, bless this body. Be present in spirit and power according to your promise. Fill us with your mercy and your love. Move us to have a living faith that gives out of thanks rather than demanding service for ourselves. We pray in your son's holy name. Amen. 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 Brothers and sisters in Christ, I've had the most extraordinary couple of days and I'm going to share with you what's been happening so that you can have this insight directly into my life and Cheryl's and our families. Uh, also to share with you something that uh, is such a God thing uh, that I think that it also will have an impact on you. And it's something I'd like us all to be thinking about as we enter into this day we call Thanksgiving uh, tomorrow. All of the usual markers, all of the usual topics, all of the usual things present in an average everyday conversation kind of go out the window when you're seated at your kitchen table talking with a homeless single mom and her daughter. It's tough to engage in the usual American chit-chat, things like, so, what do you do for a living? Oh. Or, um, don't you hate it when your car doesn't start because, oh. Hey, did you hear the latest song by, oh, probably not. You know, I was watching my favorite show the other night and then, oh. You learn very quickly when you have an in-depth conversation with a homeless person, very quickly, a couple of very critically important things. The first one is, we have such artificial conversations as Americans. We focus on such trivial things. We're so materialistic that it's actually difficult to make small talk without it somehow focusing on class, I mean social class, income, and the stuff that we have. Did you hear all of those things that I mentioned that are normally present in American small talk? So, what do you do for a living? Well, we're sizing the other person up. We're trying to find out where do you fit relative to me and my perceived or presumed social standing? What is your level of education? How much do you probably make? What kind of life do you probably live? How do you stack up materially compared to me? Or talking about songs or TV shows. Well, what you watch and what you listen to also says something about your class, social standing. Talking about a car is another way of poking and prodding around to find out, well, what do you drive? What can you afford? We look at people, what they drive, how they dress, and we try to neatly box them in and compare ourselves to them. And then in those conversations where, oh, well, um, I did my PhD at Oxford and now I work for... <gasps> Suddenly the American mind says, I am somehow lacking, I am somehow lacking, I am somehow lacking. We start to feel inferior and we look for another group of people to go stand with where we might have a little higher social standing. How shallow and trivial. Sitting at a kitchen table with a homeless person forces you into real conversation about things that actually matter. And this happens to us all the time also when we go to Haiti. You can't pop over to Haiti and talk about your car or what college you graduated from, what you hope to buy next. All these markers just don't, they just don't compute. They don't make any sense. They don't make any sense in talking with a homeless person either. So you have to get real. And you have to say something like, tell me your story. What do you know? You have to 
actually connect as a human being. What do you know? You have to actually demonstrate care and concern for that person. Hear about what's important to them. What are their hopes? What are their dreams? What are their aspirations? What are their hurts? What are their pains? What are their needs? Tomorrow is Thanksgiving, a national holiday, eh, more or less, where lots and lots of people all around the country will sit down and give thanks. And some of them will even have someone to give thanks to, us Christians. But unfortunately, so many of us will give thanks tomorrow with one eye on the turkey and the other eye on the Black Friday commercials because this is us in America. setting the number one shopping day of the year, the day when we go out and rack up and accumulate, the day when people who can't be bothered to get up in time for church on Sunday can get up before the sun to stand in line for the new 42-inch plasma TV. Isn't it ironic, not in a good way, that only here in America... Do we create a national holiday to give thanks for what we have so that the following day we can go into debt racking up more stuff? And that's precisely what we do. Sitting across the table, getting real with a single mom and a teenage daughter, that sort of thing stands in stark contrast to the crass materialism of an American culture that consistently involves itself in how do I stack up against you monetarily? How am I doing in the race to accumulate stuff? This 36-year-old native of Miami had her dad take off when she was at a young age, had her mom take off right before her teen years was shuffled around between relatives and then friends and then into a foster care system, never graduated high school, married at 19, had a child at 20, thought finally there was a relationship in her life she could count on, and then after 14 years, he just took off. And so while so many of us are worrying about how to stagger those sales on Friday to get to just the right place at just the right time to accumulate more stuff, and will the SUV be quite big enough for the haul? We spent last night at a kitchen table hearing about how a single mom spent her days for the past two months trying to find a next meal and how they had to carry a filthy sheet around with them so that at night, as they looked for alleys, buildings, or dark woods to sleep in, they could pull the filthy sheet over them and try to camouflage themselves so that people wandering around in those hours wouldn't realize they were both female. Melanie stumbled across Gloria Day about a month or so ago, came to the thrift shop. She had seen, she was homeless right here in Davie, had seen the sign, we have a thrift shop, came there, and eagle-eyed thrift shop staff thought, hmm, here's a single mom, she's come back now, and then once she bought a tent, a single mom with a teenage daughter buying a tent, ding, 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 trigger, 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 and started keeping an eye Cheryl brought it to my attention. Hey, we might have something going on here. Maybe they're homeless. They came back, and the kindness that they received at the thrift shop brought them back, brought them back. They were here last Sunday, sat out front, were ashamed to come in because when you have to live outside for two months, you're not exactly showering. What tree, what alley are you going to extract a shower from? Ashamed to come in and found a number of people willing to greet them and be kind to them. And, and good on you, by the way, for that. And a staff person who brought them down to the fellowship hall you know, for a bagel, so they got something to eat. Okay. And that kindness translated 
the next day into a return here in desperate need and hunger. And Cheryl just happened to be here and made a meal for them in the fellowship hall, and they got a hot meal and invited them back yesterday morning where we sat down and we heard their story. And everything checked out, and all their, they had all kinds of ID. We have to ask some hard questions because people come here all the time, right? And people donate hard-earned money to this place, and in order to be the best help to others, we, you know, we can't, you know, some people are for real, some people are just looking for cash. The painful truth is, is that we sometimes in the office have to make hard decisions about who can be helped and who can't, and you never know if you're making the right decision. You never know if somebody on the take is hurting things for someone really actually in need by being on the take. But these guys checked out, and so Cheryl invited them back. Come back. We'll turn on the hot water heater in the gym. We'll give you a nice hot shower. Wouldn't that be nice? And they were thrilled. That's all they wanted. That's all they asked for. But then we did something more. When they came back for their shower, I took off down the hall and I got with our director of operations. Can we help them? It turns out they've got a support system in California, but we've got to get them there. And it's really interesting what happened next, and this is the big part that I want to share with you because all these God things started to happen. So the first big point I want to make in advance, and I want you to be listening for this, is this. When we don't count the cost first, but when we value human beings above the cost, God provides the resources to make the caring happen. Bank on it. And this is a problem that we have even in the church that we go to the cost first. Here's a human need. Oh no, can't do it, can't afford it. Baloney. First of all, it's not your money, it's God's. Second of all, God will provide what the needs are. How dare we, even in the church, go to the money first and have the nerve in the face of need to say, well, you know, without even really looking at, can't afford it. That's absolutely ridiculous. I realize it's human, and I've been guilty of it myself too. It's not like I'm singling myself. And I'm like, hey, I don't do this. I'm right with you. That's the temptation. The temptation of our flesh, because we're Americans, is to go straight. What's this going to cost me? To have someone in terrible need, what's this going to cost me? We've got to stop doing that. Imagine if Jesus did that. The world needs saving. What's it going to cost me? Sins need paid for. Eh, can't afford it. The flogging's going to hurt a lot. The crown of thorns, not comfortable. The cross, heavy. Nails, <laughs> kind of pointy. What if Jesus had worried first about the cost before the care came? So some God things started to happen, and they started to happen because the caring came first. Not because there's something special about us, but because there's something special about God. And God, who has killed us and made us alive in him, was moving and doing some great things here at Gloria Day, and this is what happened. We invited them back for a shower, and then thought, well, what are we going to do for a shower? We, we never think twice about a shower at home because we've got everything already there. It's our house, and we've got our towels, and we've got our soap, and we've got our everything. We invite them over for a shower. We've got hot water. Well, it turns out that a day or two before, somebody had showed up at the thrift shop and had donated two towels. Not one towel, not three towels, but two towels. So there were two towels yesterday when two people came to take a shower well, what are we going to do for shampoo and soap and things like that? Well, somebody pulled up yesterday morning. A friend of a member here wanted to help some people out and made 10 little gift bags filled with shampoo and soap and things you need to take a shower. So we handed them a bag to go take a shower. And they needed this trip to California to get back to a job and a support system waiting for them. And... A big check came through into Barry's office so the trip could be paid for plus 
a little bit of rent money along the way. But to get out there, that's a long flight. And, and what are you supposed to do? Not eat anything all day while you're traveling? Well, a member of our congregation had seen Cheryl walking across the parking lot with these two ladies and without knowing anything else, came up to her and said, here, give this to them. She grabbed in her purse. She had $55 and she just said, here, poof, handed it over, give this to them. So now they had money to get food on the trip out. And so all of this was arranged, and oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you that it turns out that checking the flight prices, you know, I started with next Monday. I figured, well, it's Thanksgiving. It's the busiest travel time of the year. There's no way in the world the flights that we clicked on for today were cheaper than any other day for the next week. So we were able to send them today. So we decided we're going to bring them to the house last night. And of course, the sinful human flesh starts in counting the cost. I mean my sinful American flesh. I'm the protector of my family. What, am I, am I out of my mind bringing strangers into our house? What if they take something? That's how the human mind works, right? What if they take something? What if they get up in the middle of the night when we're sound asleep and knock us over the head and steal our... Mario Brothers or something. What if they take what we've given them and disappear? What if after we've done all of this and spent all of this hundreds of dollars that doesn't belong to us because it's God's and not really ours, but play along with me. What if they take all of this help that we've given and they don't even get on the plane? What if they go tell a bunch of their homeless friends and in a few days when we least expect it, we'll wake up in the night and there'll be a zombie homeless apocalypse at our house? What if people who need help know where we live? What if? That's what your mind does. Because your sinful human mind counts the cost first and thanks be to God, he snapped me back and reeled me in. And I pray that he starts and continues and always does this for you as well. Snap you back and reel you in. Um, excuse me there, dude. Sometimes he calls me dude. Not really. You know, it hit me. Here is a single mom and her teenage daughter who have for the past two months been sleeping in rain, shivering in rain, and sweating in heat, and covering up with a filthy sheet, and sleeping in bugs, and who knows what else, and not showering, and not bathing, and being in shame, and being in need, and wondering if this night is the night they'll be attacked. And I've got the nerve to wonder, should I bring them home? So I brought them home. Brought them home. Because love takes risks. Love doesn't count the cost first. Okay. Love takes risks. We need to take risks. We need to stop being so safe that we're failing to care. We need to stop being so selfish and materialistic that we're willing to rack up and rack up on Black Friday without helping people on the every other day. We need to stop measuring out pennies and being penny conscious and heart foolish. We need to stop being cheap with others while expensive with ourselves. Not just in spending money, but how we spend our heart. Isn't it true that if we feel offended, we're going to make them pay? But if we've given offense, don't we want to be justified? How does it work like that? Why isn't it the other way? Why isn't it that if we've given offense, we want to extravagantly apologize, and if someone has given us offense, why don't we count it as nothing? Jesus does that. Thanks be to God, Jesus does that with us. We want his extravagant, beautiful forgiveness. Why isn't it there for others, brothers and sisters? We want him to care for us even though we haven't earned it and don't deserve it. Why don't we do that for others? 
We want Jesus to love us without it costing us a single thing. Why don't we love others like that and care for them like that? Why do we think they've got to earn it? It's just the sin in us. It's just the sin. Here's another thing God did. Our window on our green truck, you guys all have seen our green expedition, I'm sure, by now, because it's been taped up with white marine tape, the window behind the driver's door, for over a year. You know why? Because I just knew it was going to cost several hundred dollars at Ford. I'm not paying those no good, you know, I'm not, right? So I'll tape up my window for over a year because I don't want to spend several hundred dollars on the window, right? Well, a couple of weeks ago, John Anderson came and said, I've been looking on the internet and I know how to fix your door. Let's go buy the parts. The parts were uh, 224. The labor was free. John worked on that bad boy all afternoon. Fix that window. Boom, it works. My motorcycle had to go in. It had a problem with the gas gauge. I thought, here we go, three or $400. Nope, under warranty, free. So the money we saved, we took them to Walmart. The mom and the daughter took them to Walmart last night, stocked them up, threw away their filthy clothes, threw away their filthy sheet. The mom had blisters that were getting infected all over her feet because of wearing two small shoes that are wet all the time and not being able to do anything about it. And the little girl said to Cheryl, is this a dream? Is this really happening? Ah. Pretty cool. Brought her back to the house. And then another God thing. Earlier last week, I think or so, somebody came to the thrift shop and they turned in a little Blackberry tablet. It says, you know, poor Blackberry. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, I love them. That was my first smartphone, but they're hurting. All right? It doesn't do much, but it gets on the internet. It's not worth anything to you and to me because we can get iPhones and stuff. But it was, you know, it was worth taking a look at it and fiddling with it, and we didn't know what to do with it. It was a neat toy. It doesn't do much. But this little girl, this little 16-year-old, loves to read. She wants to be an English major if she can ever get to college, a voracious reader, and doesn't have any books. So we grabbed that tablet and said, here's your new tablet. And I poked on the browser and got onto the Internet and put in free online text, and Project Gutenberg came up with thousands of free books. Classics, Hemingway, Steinbeck, Conrad, you name it, classics. So we took them to the airport today, and they cried and cried and cried. And they said, thank you, and thank the church. Tell the church we said thank you. Put them on a plane. Watch them all the way through security, waving the whole way, scared 16-year-old girl's first time ever on a plane, only mom's second time ever on a plane, put them on the plane and, uh, and sent them on their way with phone numbers and email addresses, contact us if you need help, you know. Scary, dangerous, right? They'll probably call back and want something. Yeah, so? We tend to think our money is ours. It's not. It's God's. God gives you money, and he gives it to each one of us in different amounts. But to each of us, generally speaking, he gives extra for the purpose of it being shared. You see, the extra that he gives, he gives so that you can experience the blessing of helping others with his money. The problem is, though, that we become so enamored with it, and we love it so much that we want to hoard it, and we even do this, we're guilty even of this in the church. People need help with their life. People need things. Oh, we can't, can't afford it. What if God doesn't give anymore? Really? This Thanksgiving, I'd love to see us all have a new heart. I'd love to see us enter into Advent as part of an Advent conspiracy. I'd love to see us turn this whole American materialism right upside down. I'd love to see each and every one of us make a commitment that this year's going to be different. We are not going to serve the altar of the dollar, but we're going to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're going to love like him, we're going to care like him, we're going to give like him, and we're going to love and care so extravagantly that we're going to care first, count the cost later. It will change you and change this place. 
instead of having a standard Thanksgiving where we feast until they have to roll us away in a, in a wheelbarrow, right? Instead of sitting around and admiring our stuff, what if we instead turned our American vast resources on helping people who just don't have for whatever reason, and what if they didn't have to pre-qualify for our love? And what if day after day after day after that, in the church and out of the church, this place was a place that cared first and counted cost later. In fact, cared first and waited to see God fulfill. I think they call that faith. It's the faith that he gives us. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. We were dead. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace. You have been saved. By grace, you have been saved. See, what we forget is that we were powerless, we were penniless, we were dead to God. We have not earned salvation. We do not deserve salvation, no matter how much we think we might. Rather, we're on God's welfare. We were homeless with regard to heaven. He came and rescued us out of the woods and the alleys and the awnings and drew us out of our drunken, stoned stupor, and he made us his people by dying on the cross, bleeding out his life, giving us the faith by which we receive and grasp the promises and blessings that are ours because of the completed work of Jesus Christ. It is by grace you have been saved. We didn't do this. We don't deserve this. It is purely by grace through faith in him alone. You're forgiven, you're saved, and you have eternal life. Let our giving be our thanks. Rather than counting the cost and making people qualify, rather than honoring pennies over people, let your giving be your thanks. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Christ is doing good works through you, works created in advance that you should walk in them. Let them be your thanks. Let them be your worship. Let them be your constant prayer. And this Thanksgiving, revel in the real joy, not the joy of stuff but the joy of knowing that your salvation is done, it's paid for, it's finished, it's completed, it's certain in Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior. Happy Thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. amen.